Hey guys, today we're talking about optimization in the context of game development and programming. So optimization is all about making the most of the tools available. So for programming, that generally means refactoring your original code or using techniques that will improve your game's performance and or make your code more efficient. As developers and programmers, we're interested in optimization for a few different reasons. Firstly, we want our games to perform well. Less lag means happier players. And a lack of performance issues also means we can put in more content. We can push an engine to its limits, so to speak, and fill our game with all the fun, beautiful mechanics and graphics that we want. The second reason is simply that we want to be good developers. Like with most crafts, what separates a novice from an expert is not the tool they use, but their ability to use their tool most effectively. Now, before we jump into some specific optimization tips, I want to just offer you some cautionary advice. There is definitely a balance to be struck between having some concern about performance and then just getting on and finishing your game. And this especially goes for beginners who might feel so paralyzed by the fear of coding something wrong or having to go back and start again that they end up doing nothing at all or stagnating. But revising code and refactoring is a healthy, inevitable part of programming. So don't be afraid to just jump in and code with childlike curiosity and determination, even if you don't know what you're doing. You can always go back and refactor later. All right, all that said, let's jump in and discuss some optimization tips. So while a lot of optimization advice is going to depend heavily on your specific game, some pretty safe bets for performance syncs in any kind of game is going to be the drawing of all of the sprites and graphics in your game, the collisions, and just the number of objects, because generally any performance issues that you're having is going to scale with the number of objects. So we're going to want to reduce all of these where we can. And if you already have an established project, you can test your performance yourself by running the profiler, which should be one of the first things you do if you are having performance issues, because it's going to point you to where the problem areas are. So if I just run my project in debug mode, so we can press F6 or just come up to this little bug symbol up here, then it's going to run the game and the profiler and debugger window is also going to pop up. I'm also showing a little debug overlay that just shows me the real FPS, which is sort of the real number of steps that GameMaker is performing in a second. So this is different to the room speed, which generally we set to 60 because we want 60 FPS. And generally you want this number to be as high as it can be. And as it dips lower, especially as it dips closer to 60, that's when you're going to start to see performance issues. There's a couple other numbers that are up there that we'll come back to later. But for now, let's just run the profiler. And that is down here. So we can start profiling and just let that run for a few seconds and then press stop. And down here, you can see all of your objects. And I'm just going to sort this little tab by the time. And we can see what is taking the most time while our game is running. So you can see, just like I said, the drawing is usually going to be quite high. Now, I actually have one object that is drawing all of my objects, which is why it's taking up a lot of time you might have a draw node for several objects. Now, the numbers here are a little bit arbitrary. It doesn't really matter how long it takes exactly or what the step percentage is or anything. What you're looking for is if something is taking much longer than others. And more importantly, if it's something unexpected. That is where you should be looking to optimize. All right, moving on, I've set up just a very basic demo project that I'm going to use to illustrate some of the concepts. So in this, I have just three objects. One is this blue square that is moving back and forth. These green objects here, which are all the same objects, and they're all completely empty, so they're doing absolutely nothing. And I also have an invisible controller object that can spawn more of these green objects. And up at the top, you can see here, this is the instance count of my green objects. So let's spawn some more of these green objects and see if it has any impact on performance. So that was spawning 100 more, so that doesn't seem to have had any effect on our performance. Let's do it a couple more times. All right, so we're starting to see a little bit of a dip. Let's go up in the thousands. All right, so we're starting to see a pretty significant dip and you can see just how laggy the blue square is moving across the screen now. So you can see the mere presence of objects, even if they're empty, is going to take a toll on our game. Because even if they're not doing anything, they're still part of GameMaker's pipeline. Their events are still processed and they still have to be rendered. Now let's see what happens when we add a collision to our green objects. So I'm going to make them check for a collision with our blue object. And if they find that they are colliding with it, I'm going to have them turn yellow. There we go. So did you see that big FPS drop? And it gets even more pronounced if we have multiple collision events. 
And that's not unreasonable for a game. You'll often have objects that are interacting and checking for collisions with multiple other objects. But let's think about the logic for a moment of our collision. So remember, every single green object is checking for a collision with the one blue object here. To take a more relatable example, in a game this could be analogous to having hundreds of bullets all checking for a collision with the player. And doing it this way with the many checking for collisions with the one is horribly inefficient. What we can do instead is just have our player objects checking for a collision with the bullets. This will reduce the number of collision checks from tens or hundreds to just one. So whenever you're doing your collision checks, always put the checks in the object with the fewest number of instances. A little thing to consider here though, is that collision functions such as place meeting and instance place are only able to return one collision per step. So if multiple bullets hit the player in one step, only one of them is going to be processed at a time. So you can write your own functions to get around this, but that is outside the scope of this video. Generally, it shouldn't be too much of a problem because if you do have, let's say three bullets all hitting you at once, it will still be processed in three steps, which should be imperceptible to the player. And there are a few other ways you can optimize your collisions. The collision function checks themselves are quite expensive as we've seen. And where possible, you can use other methods besides these functions. So for example, you could check for a collision with tiles instead of collision objects, or you could break your game up into a grid that stores whether particular places are free or not and check that grid if you want to move. Now, coming back to our demo project. Before we try and address the rest of the performance monstrosities I have put into this room, I'm going to introduce one more element, a view. So you're probably making use of a view in your game already, where you're showing only a portion of your entire room at any one time. And you probably have your view following your player around. So let's say at any one time, the player is only seeing what's inside this white region. So what we can do is deactivate any instance that is outside the view. So a deactivated instance is functionally non-existent in the game world. It isn't destroyed, but it isn't processed in any way. A pointer to that object is still preserved and we can reactivate the instance when we want, say when they re-enter the view. So there are a few different functions we can use for deactivating and activating instances. One way to do this is to first deactivate everything and then reactivate everything inside the view. Note though that this may not catch your controller objects that are usually placed at zero zero. So you would have to go back and manually switch those back on. But the deactivate and activating functions are actually quite costly to perform in and of themselves. So we wanna reduce the number of times we're going to call them. It would be more efficient if we could not deactivate those important system objects at all. So what we could do is take advantage of GameMaker Studio 2's layers. So you can put all of the instances that can be deactivated in one layer and keep your important instances in another. Then we can use the function instance deactivate layer and provide it with the layer where you're keeping all of the instances that can be deactivated. And then we use instance activate region just as before to turn on all of the objects that are within the region. And we want to do this so we can catch any instance that is re-entering our view. Similarly, you could also just make a parent object and have all of its children be the objects that can be deactivated and use the instance deactivate function to just deactivate those ones. All right, so take note of the FPS currently and let's see if we get any performance gain when we deactivate everything outside the view. Know that there is a huge lag spike here because we have to sort through thousands of objects and go and deactivate them. So that's just showing that that function is quite costly to perform, but we can see that our performance has improved. Still, as I said, those functions are quite expensive and in actual fact, we don't need to be doing this every step of the game. Instead, what we could do is have the deactivate and activating updating every few steps. And we can do this by putting the appropriate code into an alarm and then having the alarm reset itself every few steps. So as an example, I'll do it every second. So did you see that performance jump? Obviously this looks a little strange right now. So in your project, you might want to have it updating under a second, or you could also have the activating region be slightly larger than the view so that we have a little bit of buffer room to update. All right, moving on. So let's come back to this overlay up here. Now, remember how I said you can expect that the drawing of your sprites is going to be an expensive element of any game. And that's totally fine, it's pretty much unavoidable, but there are things that we can do to make it less expensive. So with these numbers up here in the brackets, you see this one on the right? So this one represents the number of vertex batches. So essentially when it comes time to render all of your sprites, a bunch of information about sprites vertices is sent to the GPU so it can be rendered. And to be more performant, these are sent off in groups or batches. 
So generally, the more that we can send off in one batch at a time, the better. And if we break the current batch, that is going to increase the number of vertex batches and we're going to suffer some performance loss. So it's good to be aware of what breaks a vertex batch. These are going to include changing blend modes, drawing surfaces, submitting vertex buffers, applying shaders, and drawing built-in shapes and primitives. So any of the draw rectangle, draw circle, draw health bar functions, those will all break the current batch. So most of the time, it's going to be far more performant to draw a sprite than it is to draw one of those primitives. So instead of using draw rectangle, what you can do is draw a one pixel sprite, stretched and colored as you want it, because that will not break the current vertex batch. And as for changing the blend mode and setting shaders, again, this might be something unavoidable and a crucial part of your game. But one thing to do is avoid placing these functions inside every object, even if you need it to be applied in every object, because that will break the vertex batch every time. So there are some tricks that we can do to get around this. So if you have something like this in your object's draw events, so you set the shader, have the object draw itself, and then reset the shader, that is going to cause a batch break every time. Instead, what we can do is have some sort of controller object and have it run the following code. So we set the shader, and then we go with a parent of all the objects. So of course you have to make a parent object and then all of your objects, children of that object. So essentially what this is gonna do is go into all of those objects and have it perform that function. And then once it's done, we reset the shader. So that way you're only breaking the batch once. Note though that if you're doing it this way, the objects are no longer going to be drawing themselves. So you want to remove them from the rendering pipeline by either unticking their visible check or leaving a comment in their otherwise empty draw event. All right, moving on. One more thing that causes breaks in vertex batches is texture swaps. And these are represented by the other bracketed number up here. So you can see that my numbers are extremely high, ungodly high really. Generally in your game, it's okay to have some texture swaps and batch breaks. Again, it's gonna highly depend on your game's performance. You might start to see losses after a few tens, or you might perform perfectly fine in the realm of a hundred. So what is a texture swap? Well, when your game is compiled, GameMaker puts all of your graphic resources, so all of the sprites, all the tiles, everything, onto a texture page. And by default, this is usually a page of graphics 2048 by 2048 in size. And it's this page that it's going to use when it wants to reference and pull down your sprites and draw them in your game. So when GameMaker makes these texture pages, it's gonna do its best to crop and arrange the sprites to fit the most that it can onto a texture page. But if your game has lots of sprites or has quite large sprites, it's likely that you're going to need multiple texture pages. And that means that when it comes time to draw your objects, some of them will have their sprites located on different pages. And to render them, GameMaker is going to have to perform texture swaps. So a texture swap is going to break the current vertex batch, and so it's best to reduce the number of swaps where we can. So a way you can do this is to manually assign your sprites to texture groups which you can find up here in the tools and texture groups. So by default, all of your sprites are going to be assigned to the default texture group, but you can add new texture groups if you want, and then go ahead and assign them to different groups. So for example, if you know a certain room is only going to use a subset of sprites, you could assign all of those to the same texture page. So coming back to my project, you can see that I have an extremely high number of texture swaps and batch breaks. And that is because I assigned the sprites for my boxes all to different texture groups. So if I put them all back onto the default page and then rerun the game, you can see my count went way down and I have a small performance boost. So now I'm going to move on and discuss some techniques that are probably closer to micro optimizations because they're gonna depend a lot on your specific project. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that you should not recheck what you can actually just save into a variable or a local variable. So if, for example, you need to get a value using a function, such as with input checks or getting the size of the view or something, and you need to do that multiple times in your code block, it's very inefficient to use the function call every time. Get your keyboard checks once and save them in those temporary variables. And then you can refer to that throughout your script. All right, have you ever done anything like this? So right here is just a for loop. And what I'm doing is I have a variable i. And so long as i is less than the array length of something that I've set called an instance array. So as long as i is less than the total length of that array, minus one, then I'm going to execute this code in here and then I'm gonna increment i. 
So what this basically does is just loop through an instance array and then it has each of them draw themselves. So as we know, every time this loops, i keeps incrementing and we have to check if that condition of i is less than the array length is true. But that means it's performing this function, the array length 1D function, to get the array length. So again, especially if the loop is big, it's going to be more performant to get this value once, save it in a local variable, and then use that in the loop. So finally, I want to discuss one other really handy use of local variables. There are probably going to be times that you want to address other instances in your code block. So for example, to get their position or health value. And generally, we achieve this by using the dot operator or using the with statement or other. But it's important to realize that these jumps between different instances can be costly. You can think of it like if you're reading a book. So you're reading down the page of the book in a fairly efficient manner, taking in all of the information. But then suddenly you hit upon a note that refers you to a value in another book. So you have to go and get up, find the other book, and then find the page you were directed to. Read that part and then come back to your original book. And sometimes this is completely necessary, that's fine. But it's good to reduce the number of jumps. Say we had a variable in one instance's create event called max health equals five. And in some condition of its step event, maybe something that is going to initiate a full heal. So just like before, we use a for loop to go through an array, which let's say contains the instance IDs of all the objects whose health we want to change. So we pull out a specific instance each time we loop, then we go with it, which means we're kind of jumping into that instance and we're having it perform the rest of this code inside these curly brackets. So inside here, we change its health and we also update its sprite index. So we set this value to the original instance's max health. So we've had to use an other prefix here to jump back to the original instance. So every single time we loop, this is gonna require two jumps, first into an instance and then back to get the max health value. But we can use a local variable here so that we only have to jump once. Because unlike those instance variables, the scope of a local variable covers this entire code block. So we can just save the max health value to a local variable m health, and then inside the loop, we can set my health equal to that value. Again, the performance gain that you get from this is gonna depend on how big the loop is and how often you're performing the loop. So something like the situation I just described before, to be honest, that probably isn't going to happen much and having a tiny drop in performance during one step of your game really isn't going to be noticeable. But still, this is probably a more efficient way to structure that code. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for today. Let's just do a quick summary of what we've discussed. So remember, if you're having performance issues, use the profiler to find the source of those issues. Deactivate instances outside the view. Reduce the number of collisions where possible. Keep your vertex batches and texture swaps as low as you possibly can. Also, don't repeatedly look up what you can just save once. If you can make it local, do it. All right, so obviously I haven't covered everything in this video. There are plenty of other things you can do to optimize your game. But to prevent this from going on forever, we'll stop it here for today. Just remember that optimization isn't the be all and end all. There are trade-offs that often have to be made. A super optimized system isn't always going to be the most elegant or readable. And sometimes clarity and simplicity in your code is orders of magnitude more helpful than shaving a couple nanoseconds off your computing time. So please don't feel that you need to implement all of these strategies. It may be that you don't need any of them. As long as your game consistently runs at a good FPS, you're as good as gold. Your players are never going to know how messy it is under the hood. So just get out there and make the game. So today's topic was actually chosen by a vote on Patreon. So I'd like to thank everyone who voted and everyone who is supporting me there to make these tutorials. I'd also like to give some special shout outs to Daniel Hargrave, Dolan Techman, Max Molinaro, Uthelian, Corey S, Sano, The Great Poultry, XD Game Studio, Chris J, Colin McLernan, David Howes, and Stuart Wells. I hope you guys are well and I'll see you next time.